Good morning. Welcome to Christ Community Church. We are going to continue our study of the book of Colossians this morning. We're going to start in Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 8 through 12, and then we're going to look at verses 16 through 23. We're not going to spend a lot of time commenting on 16 through 23 because they actually add commentary to what's going on in the rest of chapter 2. So we need to look at them, and then next week we'll jump back and we'll look at verses 13 through 15 uh, next week. But if you look at Colossians 2, you can see it divided very clearly in two basic se- uh, sections. Number one is the section that is communicating in 8 through, 5, 8 through 15 that you are already complete in Christ. And there's an implication to that. Therefore, as we'll see in 16 through 23, because you are complete in Christ, do not submit to Jewish or pagan regulations. These are regulations that are carried over from the former Jewish or pagan religions that the Colossian Christians were a part of. And and what you're going to begin to see, I hope that you begin to see, is why I have such a passion for continuing continuing to use a word that almost always there's someone that's frustrated by it because they're not familiar with it. And I just want to keep using it until we're all familiar with it because I think that you hopefully will see here in Colossians why I'm so passionate about it, and that word is ideology. We'll define it later in the sermon. We're going to continue to talk about it. But what Paul is saying here is that is that once you begin to follow Christ, you are going to face a temptation to either put your faith in the fullness of Christ within you or you will default to something that you can see and control, and that's usually some kind of system of ideology. Now, for some Christians, that will be a Christian ideology. For others, it will be a more of a secular ideology that they've learned how to compromise with their Christian ideology, so they kind of come up with something new, which is exactly the situation that's going on here in in the church in Colossae. So it's an important idea. You know, I was reading some of the numbers that are coming in from some of the surveys that have been being done since 2019. And so uh, essentially the base, basic average numbers, these are the average numbers. That means in some churches, these numbers of course are smaller in others, there are more. But the average number is, if you can look around the sanctuary, in general, the churches in America, a third of our brothers and sisters chose to not come back and continue to this journey with us. 30% of Christians did not return to in-service services after, as the pandemic started lessening up. Now, we're still in the early, early days. That may change. These are just the numbers thus far. The pastor numbers are even more discouraging. 50% of pastors either quit or tried to quit the ministry during the pandemic. 50% in America strove to either resign or make a plan for resigning, and maybe they didn't or didn't follow through with it, but they either quit or they made a plan to quit during the pandemic. Now, you look at those numbers, 50% of pastors, 30% of Christians. Here's what I would say. Those people were not struggling with the failure of the living Lord of all, Jesus Christ. They were struggling by being confronted with the limitations of their ideology that had become the mediation of that relationship for them. People weren't quitting on Christ. They're quitting on their ideology that couldn't sustain them. And so we had a moment here where the pandemic just revealed something that had been true for years, which was more and more the flow of the church was to be gravitated to be a discipleship of an ideology rather than learning how to be a disciple of the living Christ. And this is why this discussion of ideology becomes so critically important because if it were a pagan ideology, most Christians would understand, no, that's probably not for me. But the moment you hyphenate Because now Christian is an adjective, it's no longer a noun, and God forbid it be a verb that we act on. It's mostly an adjective. Christian movies, Christian music, and Christian ideology. Well, the moment you put Christian in front of it, people think this is okay, this is to give my life to. Now, again, I am not saying that we never organize our belief systems or our thinking. That is not what I'm saying. What I am saying is these Systems always serve the Savior. 
They do not mediate the Savior. And it's of critical importance that we understand the difference between the two because we are called to put our faith in a living person, not the theology or the institutional religion that was inspired by that person. Do you see those? Again, I'm glad to be a Christian. I'm glad we're in a Christian church. And, you know, I've got three kids in college and so forth. And so I'm really happy of that. But what I'm saying is at the same time, we have to understand that sometimes the religion inspired by Christ hasn't necessarily always maintained the spirit of Christ. And it is that difference where we lose people and we come up really with false ideas about what's really going on in people's hearts. And we have to talk about this, the way in which our ideologies have become identities and idolatries. And this is what Paul's gonna address here. So what he says here, let's just jump right into it. We'll just take it a verse at a time. Verse 8, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than Christ. Now, so this is really, really critical. This is when we are assessing and we're thinking about the things that tempt people away from their faith of Christ. I think I've said this before. There's a basic narrative, it seems, that I've caught around evangelical Christians is once someone comes to Christ, you just make sure that they don't get carried away in indulging the sins of the flesh because it's the sins of the flesh that distract, distract us from our faithfulness to Jesus. And so I've ordered my life around that belief both for myself and for others, made that my preoccupation. When in reality, as you look at the scripture, what tempts us away from Christ are the things we assume we finally figured out. That is when faith stops and we start walking in certitude. And certitude is the very opposite of the humility of the life of faith. And so, um, and so what we see here, the, these are the cautions. Now, I am not saying if you have an addictive personality, you shouldn't be cautious with substances. You should. I, I'm not taking away from that, nor am I saying that that's not actually an issue for some folks. But by and large, that's not the primary thing that concerns me. What concerns me is not us being taken uh, captive by the addiction of the flesh, but rather if we're being taken by the addiction of wise sounding reasonable arguments that lure our affection away from being centered on the experience of the living Christ who's chosen to live in us as the hope of glory. And instead we put it on a system of beliefs and practices. Because you look at what this verse is saying. He's, it's a caution. Number one, be careful is what Paul says. Be cautious, be careful. Careful, which means that he's saying that is that it is that he's warning against something that has a real potential for distracting us. So he says, be careful, look, that no one takes you captive. So the imagery that he's using here is someone being ensnared and taken captive uh, against their will. And so this is the imagery that he chooses to use. And look how it's going to happen. He says, be careful that no one takes you captive through, number one, philosophy. Philosophy simply means the love of wisdom. Now again, as we're gonna say in the closing, this is not to say that it's wrong to read philosophy. Go ahead and just keep that up for a few minutes while we're talking about it. It's not wrong to, um, to, to read philosophy and to love wisdom, but it is wrong to put philosophy and wisdom in its improper place in terms of how we are using this to guide our lives to be faithful to Jesus. Then he says the second thing, which is even more pejorative from philosophy to straight out empty deceit. And then he says this, this philosophy and empty deceit will be based on two things, human tradition and the elements of the world contrasted with rather than Christ. Human tradition, the elements of the world rather than Christ. Two things, foundations for this philosophy and deceit, human tradition and the elements of the world. I think human tradition is fairly self-explanatory. Thank you for keeping that up. I appreciate that. Um, uh, human tradition, but what about this idea of elements of the world? 
What exactly does that mean and how does it relate to what Paul is saying here? This is why we're going to look at in just a few moments verses 16 through 23 because it is in reading 16 through 23 that we will come to understand what Paul is talking about when he talks about the elements of the world. He is not thinking about, um, he's not, he is not primarily talking about philosophical or agnostic or atheistic philosophies. That's not what he's talking about. This phrase, elements of the world, have to do with whatever spiritual training they received prior to their revelation of Christ in you, the hope of glory, and how they have worked that into their current walk with the living Christ. And Paul's saying it carries with it the threat of potentially pulling their faith away from Christ. Now, this idea of the elements, or what some people call the, quote, Colossian his, uh, heresy, is a little obscure. When you take what Paul says about it and how he describes it in verses 16 through 23, then it could be a handful of things that Paul's talking about. Some commentary, uh, 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 um, commentators and, um, and scholars are fiercely loyal to the idea that Paul's simply talking about the Judaizers. And if you remember, the Judaizers were a group of believers in Christ that felt that in addition to trusting Christ as their Savior and experiencing Christ in you, the hope of glory, they felt pagan and Gentile believers also needed to, to submit to some of the practices of the Jewish law. And so they would come after the proclamation of the gospel and they would add this other requirement. If you want to see what Paul really thinks about that group of individuals, just read the book of Galatians. Galatians is a very intense Passion, passionate, polemical letter that he wrote against the Judaizers. And as we're going to look in this list, there certainly are some of those elements. Um, and so I am comfortable with that view, but I re respect the other views. Other people say, no, there are too many things uh, in this list that would not be practiced by a faithful Jew. Therefore, Paul's talking about some kind of obscure sect of Jewish mysticism. Well, okay, fine, whatever. And then others will say, no, no, he's not talking about anything Jewish at all. He is, uh, he is talking about paganism and, 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 and the pagan practices of their other religion of all the other gods around them that they worshiped, possibly. And then yet another person's going to say, no, 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 you've all got it wrong. It was a blend. They took and they mixed and matched. It's a little bit of Judaism, a little bit of Jewish mysticism, a little bit of pagan mysticism, and they blended it together in its own kind of unique thing. But the point that I am making is whichever way, and if you're, in, if you're a person that's interested in that, get on the Google and pour yourself a cup of tea or a glass of wine and have a great time this afternoon. Um, and, and you can come up with convictions about where you stand. For me, it's almost a secondary discussion. In all of those interpretations, what you see is people taking a body of beliefs and practices and holding them on par with their faith in Christ. And, and they're drifting to where they're, they're, they're putting trust in these ideological systems. And the problem is it makes it very hard to, to obey Jesus' call to not judge lest you be judged once you give yourself over to discipleship to ideology because ideology is built on the idea that there's information here that you need to know and once you have it, you'll have it and other people don't have it. Well, what do you do with that? Well, either you, uh, you, you, you try to get those people to be convinced that what you think is right and they should think like you, or if they won't do that, then you just dismiss them as part of the them that you're against. That's what ideolo ideologies allow us to do. They create common enemies for us to hate, and that allows us to have this bonding intimacy. It's a sick intimacy, but it is an intimacy nonetheless. So they allow us to have an enemy, and they allow us to have a standard that we represent, and then they allow us to make judgments on who's in and who's out, who's good and who's bad. This is what ideologies do. Ide the idea of ideologies is introduced very quickly in the story of the Bible. It's found in Genesis chapter 3, although instead of ideology, it is called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But this is what ideologies empower you to do. You can tell God to go on vacation 
He no longer needs to be the judge of the world because now we know good and evil just like him. Do you guys remember the dialogue? And so now we can sit on that throne. We are the ones that can now determine who's deserving of grace and who isn't. We can now determine who's in and who's out, who's better and who's worse. This is what ideology does. And even though we're not familiar with the word, my friends, it is part of the story of our scriptures from the very beginning, and it gets the blame for why things went wrong. It is not this generic idea of sin. It is not just the generic idea of the flesh. And for God's sake, I hope you've let go of the idea it's because of women, because Eve was tempted with the apple. It is not for any of these reasons. What gets the blame is ideology. It is entrusting yourself, themselves, to ideology rather than the invitation to walk in intimacy with God in the cool of the day. So, this idea of elements is very important. Now, the problem is, this word is actually really complicated, and there's not a whole lot of agreement initially on what this word meant, but as you study more, you can start to see the schools of thought Emerging, And I'm simply going to share with you a few quotes from some commentators. I did not put most of these on the overhead. I put one, but they're in your notes. So if you go look at the words helps, if you look at the interlinear Bible on the internet, and you can click on words, it'll take you right to the Greek word of the English translation, and you can read the history of these words. Well, this particular word, which I'm not going to attempt to pronounce, because honestly, I would only be doing it to impress you anyway. And so... Um, uh, but you'll see it there in print. It refers to the rudiments with which mankind were indoctrinated before the time of Christ. That is to say, the elements of religious training or the ceremonial precepts common alike to the worship of Jews and Gentiles. In other words, it, whether they were Jewish or pagan, there were some basic elementary principles for how they understood the world work and how we were supposed to relate to that organization of the elements. Both things like earth, wind, and fire, but all also the potential uh, demonic or angelic deities that, that, that had control over these elements. This is how the world was understood. Now, one of the things that's so important is that whenever we read this idea about not being conformed to the world, we are reading it in a time that is primarily post-religious. So when we hear the word world, we're taught to believe that it's the big bad boogeyman that's going to undermine your worldview and eventually steal your faith in Christ away from you. You, right? So we don't listen to the world, the music of the world, the philosophies of the world, the world, the world. And so we start interpreting these things like, oh, don't listen to Lady Gaga or let your kids play Pokemon. Well, well like there may be legitimate reasons. I mean, if your kids know Gaga, but they don't know Fleetwood Mac, you're failing as a parent. So I understand that there are, there are some, some strengths to some of these arguments. But by and large, what we have to be careful of is that this is not what the Bible's talking about. Because when they're talking about a competing worldview, they are talking about a theistic worldview. They are talking about a religious worldview. Because by and large, when the scriptures were written, the idea of an atheist did not exist. That, 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 that would have been foreign to them because everyone had a religious worldview. So when the Bible is contrasting ideologies of faith in Christ and faith of the world, it's not talking about non-religious ideologies. It is talking about organized religious ideologies. That is the temptation that lures us away or had the potential of luring the Colossians away from the simplicity of their faith in Christ. Another commentator said the basic principles of the world are likely to be worldly ethical rules, in particular the Judaic law, the Mosaic law, as taught by the Judaizers with their particular emphasis on the minutia of the law. And as we read the list, you'll say, yeah, that's most definitely present here in in this list that, that Paul uses to describe this particular ideology. I think Douglas Moo is, has, has a really powerful quote, partly because in full disclosure, Douglas Moo here is quoting, uh, and he is um, affirming the view that Paul's talking about some form of the Judaizers, even though Douglas Moo actually doesn't agree with that interpretation. He has a different interpretation. But it's one thing to get someone who agrees with an idea 
to promote it, but it's another thing if someone disagrees with it and yet they still promote it. It means they recognize the merit in that. So here's what Doug Moo said about this word that is translated elements or rudiments or principles. It would, then be, it would then be very natural for Paul to describe the law and its particular requirements, circumcision, abstinence from certain foods, and celebration of holy days as elementary principles. So I think even though this is just already far of speaking because I didn't find this in a scholarship, but to me when I read that, this idea of elements and rudiments sounds a lot like fundamentals. So, so yes, they were struggling with ideologies that communicated the elemental, ele, elemental principles of the world, whereas I think that our struggle, if we go from their story to our story, you could say fundamentalism in all its expressions, because this is also what fundamentalism does. It says we can know for certain, certain laws that explain the religious universe that God has created. These are certain, they are unquestionable. If you believe them, then you can have certainty yourself. And if you doubt them, then you need to be careful. You either need to suppress that doubt, you need to talk to someone who can talk you out of that doubt, or you pretend like you don't have it. Because, because ideological systems require your intellectual loyalty. That's how they work. That's how they are sustained. So therefore, so anything that moves away from that intellectual loyalty within a group is going to be condemned because it threatens the whole system, if that makes sense. So, so basically this word, it's an obscure word that's best understood as principles or propositions. Or another way that we could call it, refer to it is as ideology. Ideology, and again, let's revisit our definition. I'd like to bring it up a time or two in case we've forgotten. Ideology is sim simply a system of ideas about human life or culture. A system of ideas about human life and culture. And typically these systems are, are, are created to answer ultimate questions about the human experience and explain behaviors and allow us to be experts of judging as to why people do certain behaviors and they don't do the right behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, elemental principles are all power, authority, or ideological structures, whether political, economic, racial, secular, religious, conservative, or progressive, etc. These are the elementary, elemental principles. These systems can become rivals to Christ if they beckon their followers to find their fuller security in them rather than in the new life of Christ within. And you'll see this because one of the things that I would hope to gradually see changed in Christian friendship conversations is instead of having passionate discussions about what we believe, which again, it's fine that we have those. I love to have those as much as the next guy. I remember my favorite part of theology class was listening to that linchpin argument that I knew some of my lesser intellectually developed fellow students needed to hear. And I literally can see little Artie right now salivating over hearing some piece of theology and going, oh, I've got them now. And writing that down in my notebook. And then we do an intermission of class and I can see obnoxious little 20 something Artie jumping up from his seat, immediately walking to the back of the classroom because I wanted to corner two of the students so I could smash them intellectually with what I'd learned from this piece of theology. Now, luckily, everybody in the classroom was that obnoxious about it. But it would be really great if at some point, instead of us sitting around coffee shops and talking about the minutia of where we disagree or agree on our beliefs, what if we got together with friends and we were talking about how we've encountered Christ this week? And we're not just rehashing the same old discussions because Christ is like manna. It's new every day. And you don't get to take today's revelation and store it up for tomorrow's ideology because that's what we're tempted to do. We wanna take a fresh revelation, turn it into an ideology, we go to the cabinet and it's been eaten by maggots because that's how manna works. 
Jesus Christ, God and his mercies are new every single morning. They're like the dew on the ground. They're refreshed, they're new, they start over. This is what's beautiful about the cycle of life that God gives us. This is why we don't have to be preoccupied with successful ideologies as we aim for perfection because in every 24 hours, God gives us a reset. The day ends and a new day begins. The week ends and a new week begins. The month ends and a new month begins. The year ends and a new year begins. The season ends and a new season begins. But this rhythm goes back to the 24 hour period. We are constantly getting a reset of this revelation of Christ. And so, wouldn't it be amazing if we were all more comfortable talking about how we encountered Christ in a new way this week? Well, here's some of you who are thinking about starting a community group. How about this? You start a community group and that's your only discussion point. You're not talking about the sermon. You're not talking about whether or not you enjoyed the music this, this Sunday morning. You're just having a community group to get together, drink some coffees, eat some finger foods, have some scones. And then everybody sit around and say, tell me how you encountered Christ this week. And let's hear the stories, not of your time at Falls Creek when you were seven, but this week, how you were aware of Christ in you, the hope of glory, and how you encountered Christ in the face of the other. Or if you really want to have a tightly knit community group, be honest and say, here's how I know as I've prayed on my week and reflected, the Holy Spirit has shown me, here's basically how I neglected Christ this week. Because we grow from answering that question. And so, so that would be remarkable because, but instead what we like to do is not think about our faithfulness to Christ and discuss our faithfulness to our ideology. We love to get together on that. We like to have conferences about that and write books about it, have YouTube channels about it. Verse nine and 10. Now, now, now look at this. Let's look at verse eight one more time. He says, be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on the human tradition on the elements of the world rather than Christ. Now he's gonna tell you why. Here's the reason why you don't need that. Now look at what he does. He doesn't launch into a discussion about ideology. He points to a bigger reality. And in verse nine, he says this for, here's the reason why you don't want anyone taking you captive for, the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. And you have been, what? Filled by him. Who is the head over every ruler and authority? And look at that last phrase. Here is what Paul's argument is. When you submit to ideological systems, you are actually taking your faithfulness away and your focus away from the fullness of Christ within you and you're submitting a system over which Christ is head. And so he said, you're like taking yourself out of the direct relationship with Christ and you're putting yourself relating to a mediated ideological system instead. But guess what? Jesus is Lord over that system as well. That's what Paul says. In fact, if we were going to make a graphic about, uh, from um, Colossians 2, uh, 8 and 9, or 9 and 10, it might look like this. You see this? For in Christ, God dwells bodily, and Christ fills you. You have the real thing. You don't relate to the textbook about the real thing. The textbook might give you language to express your experience. It might give you insight to an angle you hadn't thought about before that will enrich your experience. But in the end, I want to be with 
Jennifer Deanne Rogers Favre, I don't want her biography to be a substitute for that relationship. And it doesn't mean that I wouldn't learn from some things. If she ever lets me peer into a journal, which I wouldn't do unless she asked me to, I might read and learn something about her I didn't know that will enhance my overall experience, but it would never replace it. It would only supplement that experience and that communication that we're having. So the reason why you don't define yourself by your theological system or your particular doctrines that you love. The reason why you don't define yourself by those is because those are only there to serve you so that you can have expression for the real thing, which is your experience of being filled with the fullness of God because Christ dwells within you as the hope of glory. This is not a religious system. It is a living person. So, the reason why Colossians need not be taken captive by other ideological elements or principles is because the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled by Christ, and Christ is the head of every other ruler or or authority, including ideological authorities. Don't seek to mediate your spiritual experience to a belief system or another Christian or an authority figure or an institution. When we do this, we are not learning the proper lessons from history because it always turns out the same. But you are called to something more dignified. You are called to learn about who you've become as part of the new humanity that was risen with Christ when love conquered death, when love won. That's the substance that fills your soul. This is why true programs of discipleship or spiritual growth should focus on who you are and what you possess rather than who you should be and what you lack. But a system, as I said last week, will only work if it provides enough information to make you think you're getting better, but it never actually gets around to giving you the solution. Because the moment you don't stumble upon the solution, you no longer have the same need for the system, and then the system is threatened. But Christ is the answer. He doesn't give you all your answers, but he is the answer. It is Christ. Christ is the wisdom, the expressed wisdom of God, the very life of God in your soul. Now, what are the natures of these elements of the world that threaten to compete with loyalty to Christ alone for the Colossians? Well, let's just read through it real quick, shall we? Verses uh, 16 through 23, here's what he says. Therefore, don't, I'm going to give you a second. You have to look this up because it was such a longer verse. I didn't want to burden the uh, presentation crew. So you'll need to turn in your Bible or flip over in your phone. I'll be reading out of the Christian Standard Bible translation. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine growing up in a church where that was its primary verse? Most of the churches I were involved with couldn't exist if we were aware of this verse that existed. Um, but, but let's read it again just for fun. Therefore, don't let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Sabbath day, that's why they say, ah, see, this is Judaizers. And here's why, verse 17 is the reason why I think the Judaizer argument is the strongest one. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices. Ascetic practices, these are practices that are meant to make the body uncomfortable. So throughout the history of religious devotion, be it Christian or pagan, ascetic practices would be things like fasting, 
Um, because, you know, when you're fasting, you get weak and you get irritable and you get cranky and you're like, and you get in pain. And man, after that first three hours, it really gets bad. And so, so like fasting or, or, or some, some Christians would practice uh, sleep deprivation and, and to where you stay up all night. And again, it does the same thing to your mind that fasting does. It kind of starts to break down the defenses of the ego. This is why these practices have, have found value in them. And I'm not saying that we should never uh, pursue ascetic practices, but we have to understand what their purpose is and what their limitations are. But that's things like that sleep deprivation, fasting, um, you know, not eating meat on certain days, wh whatever it may be. But you kind of get, it's these practices that make you uncomfortable. And they're meant to weaken and subdue the flesh so that the spirit can be liberated. Um, so by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold to the head, which is Christ, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with the growth from God. See, this is what ideological programs compete with. They create artificial growth like the discipleship industrial complex that we talked about that can produce the fake apples. Okay, but they don't, um, but, uh, but, it, but that's not the same thing as growth that is organic from the Spirit of God. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, which is if you died with Christ to your formal, former religious ideology, then why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what was destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although these have a reputation for wisdom, by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. Which is why, if you look at the history of spiritual communities and religious communities, oftentimes these strict Sets that supposedly had a key for overcoming to the indulgence of the flesh, what happens? They're investigated and you find out that they are toxic and full of abuse to children and to women. Well, how can that be? They don't eat any cows and they fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays and they pray around the clock and they, uh, the, because these things do not curb the indulgence of the flesh. The only thing that allows me to modify my nature is by living by my higher renewed nature in Christ. That is what curbs the longings and desires of the flesh, not my discipline. So if we were gonna categorize these things, then he's talking about judgments regarding, look at this, food, drink, Matters of a festival, is this a special day or not? Matters of a new moon, matters of a Sabbath day. And I mean, if you think that we don't struggle with these, it was, I don't know what churches did before the internet because I didn't know what anybody else was doing before social media. But I remember the first time there was a Sunday on a Christmas after the internet. I don't know how churches handled that before. By and large, churches that don't have many volunteers probably just had church as normal. Because, hey, if you're paid to pray, you better be up here to pray on Sunday morning. I don't care if it is Jesus' birthday, right? But then there were all these churches who the only way they did what they could do on Sunday morning was through an army of volunteers. Well, Volunteers don't get paid to pray. And volunteers have children that they want to wake up with on Christmas morning 
And so these larger churches that had primarily a volunteer force made the decision to have maybe a Christmas Eve service but not have Sunday morning service on Christmas Day. And you should have seen people's reactions, labeling these churches as heretic places and that they've fallen away from their faithfulness to Christ, all because out of their devotion to Christ, they thought about what was, might be best for their volunteers and made a different organizational judgment for one Sunday. And immediately, Christians began to attack those churches and those leaders as being unfaithful to Jesus. See, we get caught up in this too. Now, here's what's really funny. Most of those people criticizing, they weren't coming to church on Christmas morning. They were just criticizing the fact that there wasn't someone else up there having to do that when they weren't. Okay. <laughs> or, so there's judgment regarding all of these things, or there's condemnation from those who delight in ascetic practices, practice the worship of angels, or claim access to a visionary realm. And then there was a third category of submitting to regulations. Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. So we could summarize this this way. He's talking about basic legalism from, number one, rules about what one must do. Number two, pressures to elevate spiritual experiences to a level of authority. And number three, rules about what one does not do. Now... It's 11, 12, so we're landing the plane. But this is, I wanna make sure that I'm not misunderstood here. Here's the thing. If you decide to become an apprentice of Jesus in the school of life, if you decide to become his disciple, there are some things the Spirit's gonna tell you not to do. And if you decide to begin to understand what it means to live from the living Christ who dwells within, you're probably gonna have some spiritual experiences that you may or may not wanna share with anyone else. Maybe they are for the privacy of your own history with God. But if you're going to relate to a creator that you can't visibly see, part of that's going to include moments and experiences that you can't always explain. And you might experience a vision. It would be foolish for anyone who honors the Bible to believe that a Christian couldn't have a vision from the Spirit. I mean, you just need to... There's no value in the Scriptures at all if you don't believe that. That's clearly something that can happen. Or maybe God's love will overwhelm you in a moment. Or maybe you'll be compelled to just pray desperately for someone that you know and later find out that they were in a time of need. All of these kinds of stories I, I love to hear, I love to share, I love to experience. And if you follow Jesus, there are gonna be some things that he's gonna ask you to let go of and maybe not participate in either forever or for a season. So I'm not saying that there's never a place where there's principles that guide our behavior or there's not a place for enjoying spiritual experience. The problem is when we authorize those things over and above the authority of Christ. So now, since whenever I prayed, I had some kind of inexplic inexplicable experience, well, I'm gonna define that as spirituality I'm gonna write a book about my spiritual experience and I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be speaking at conferences and maybe I'll start a church around that experience and now my private spiritual experience becomes the standard of spirituality. Well, Adam, did you have that experience in prayer? Well, you'll get there, brother. What, what's your thought life like? What you been watching on television, you know? Let's get into that a little bit. Oh, Summer had that experience. Let's elevate her. Look, she's affirming my experience as the leader here. That proves it. You see, this, this is what we get into. Just because God ta told you to stop listening to Fleet Fleetwood Mac doesn't mean that I have to stop listening to Fleet Fleetwood Mac, et cetera, et cetera. But you see, it, it is like we're becoming real people and we're making our individual decisions based on what's best for us as we follow our Lord who has his best intention for us. But we don't place that on other people. This evangelical preoccupation with controlling the beliefs and behaviors of others is ridiculous and it's to toxic. It's neurotic. Just let that go. 
Don't make your experiences the authority for others. Just be grateful for how the Spirit is leading you. And if it's bearing the fruit of the gospel in your life, what's it to you that someone else honors or dishonors those regulations? This is the call that Paul is bringing us into. With the worship team come forward and prepare to close the service. So in conclusion, my friends, this section of Colossians reminds us that we can build our life on Christ or we can build our life on religious or secular ideology. We can follow rules or we can live from relationship. We can strive to live according to a moral ideal or we can learn to follow the life of Christ within. But here's the trick. No one can serve two masters. We must choose and we must be aware of the choice that we are making. Because if we do not purposely choose to align ourselves around the life of Christ, our souls will drift to the ideology that promises certitude and that we can see. And that's why we must be vigilant to guard against it. So we're gonna get ready to take communion. I wanna share with you a prayer that comes from a song that a former acquaintance of mine wrote. It's simply called uh, Center by Charlie Hall. And one of my favorite songs that Charlie has ever written, and I like to play it repeat, repeat on my devotional um, uh, worship list, but I also like to take it and just read the lyrics as a prayer. I want to share it with you because, um, uh, again, I'm not creating a new regulation that if you're going to be really CCC, then you pray this prayer every morning. I'm just sharing with you my experience. This has been helpful and edifying for you, me, and maybe it might be edifying for some of you as well. And I want us to read this prayer together, and, and as we do, we will take communion. So I'll go ahead and mention the way we'll do communion. If you're a visitor with us, uh, you are welcome at the communion table. You don't have to be a member of the church to take communion. We'll start off in the back corner, and 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 uh, if, 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 if I can't really see in the shadows right now, but we'll start with that, the, the person in the back corner over there, if they'll, they'll just come down the aisle this way and they'll get the communion elements and go back around to their seat and then everyone else will follow. Same is true over here. And I forgot to tell the people in the middle what to do last time and there was a traffic jam. So we will start from this back, my left over here, goes from the back and comes forward and we'll work our way to the front. Those are the logistics. Now, what are you gonna do during that time? Well, you're gonna worship. They've prepared a reflective song for us to maybe create an atmosphere where we can kind of have a few moments alone with the spirit. You can pray on your own or maybe you want to share, pray this prayer. Would you all stand with me? Would you go ahead and bring that prayer up, Kara? Jesus, you're the center of the universe. Everything was made in you, Jesus. Breath of every living thing. Everyone was made for you. You hold everything together. You hold everything together. Oh Christ, be the center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes. Be the center of our lives. Amen.